podcast episode where I was in the power plant and I tell this story about a power plant that's very active and one day it just shuts down. At the middle of nowhere, just shuts down. And the employees are running around, they're, they're frantic with their heads cut off. And finally, the operations manager after three hours says, okay, we gotta get some outside help. They call a local technician. Technician's like, you're lucky, I'm right around the corner. Technician shows up and he's, he surveys the power plant for about a few minutes he, and there's full of beams everywhere. He goes to one specific beam and on there, there's all these electrical boxes. He goes to one specific electrical box. He puts a big X with a magic marker on it. And he opens it up and there are all these bolts and wires and screws. He goes to one specific screw and he turns it not a quarter of an inch and all of a sudden the whole power plant lights up again. And the, the operations manager like, thank you, you saved our, our, our business, you saved the day. How much do I owe you? He's like, that will be $10,000. And he's like, what? You were here for five minutes. All you did was turn a screw. He's like, you know, how can you even justify that? He's like, give me an itemized bill. He's like, no problem. Technician reaches his back pocket, takes out a piece of paper, scribbles on it, tears off the sheet, gives it to him. And he's like, oh, I understand. He goes to his desk, writes a check for $10,000, hands it to the man. And he basically, and you look at the, the, the invoice, if you will, and it says, turning screw, $1. Knowing what screw to turn, $9,999. <laughs> And, and the lesson is for people who are listening is not that you have a screw loose, is that little things can make a big difference. Here's some examples of site selection. Florida's got a, a sandy loam soil. Ormuson showed y'all pictures of a, of a clay loam soil. And there's differences in holding capacity and exchange capacity for nutrients. One thing about the sand, which is doesn't look like it's here, but uh, at one time a bedded grove and the growers trying to get more plants into the acre. So this is site is really sandy and you see all the weeds coming up. He put the ground cover down, which is a good idea, but you still have weeds that grow up where the holes planted, where the plant is, uh, that'll compete against the plant. So with ground cover, try to minimize your hole or put it back in and put a sta ground staple in to protect those weeds from coming up because it that's what the purpose is, is it helps protect against weed pressure. Because the very first year in planting bamboo in Florida is critical because it's, it's going through a lot of competition from these weeds. And weeds are like parasites. They're pulling these things down. They're robbing your fertilizer and water. The plant's going to be half the produ production if you have a lot of weed pressure. Uh, this isn't real bad, but it's going to become bad if you don't do something about it quickly. Some people want to put straight mulch, six to eight inches thick, and just put a band of it. Or you can put it around where the area is where it's planted and save from having to put it in here. But uh, that's the purpose of the mulch as well. It holds moisture in, help get the plant established, and it helps keep weed pressure out. But it's not 100% on the weed. Here's some uh, on the East Coast. What uh, This is shavings from like horse stalls. It's got some organic matter of the manure. Uh, you can see they've got it bedded up because cause they're compensating for the flatwoods type of soil. It's a sandy loam, but it's got a tight texture like most flatwood soils have, also helps in holding fertilizer in, making the soil healthy. Microbes is another area that would be beneficial in this type of soil. So this is a bedded grove. That's a better. You probably have seen these. That's, that's what lays this here. Pest, this is still kind of new to us. Maybe Ormuson can help us on this. This is a carmine mite. It's a type of spider mite. It's a little bigger than a red spider. It's probably about what, twice the size? About twice the size. Uh, but there's predatory mites that are out, out in our fields naturally. That's what that little speck is. So that little speck will eat that big speck, believe it or not. We do have, they do get mealybugs. And, you know, of course, we got a new mealybug in, in Florida. There's parasitic mealybug parasites. That's called a mealybug destroyer. And it actually parasitizes on that. And you can buy these uh, biologicals. Uh, through a couple of different companies like Sagena or BioLine, because I think biological is a, a safer way to go. Um, talking about the pests, there's not very many in, at, at Bothers Bamboo, which uh, we're, we're lucky because I know in Citrus we have about everything in the world hitting us. This is a statute about bringing in seed. That's the quarantine I was talking about earlier. You can write that down, but that's the law. Like me, I get inspected every 30 days by the USDA and the state. And when they see the bamboo, the first thing they're going to ask me is where'd that bamboo come from? And if I say, well, I brought, I had some seed. I say, okay, where'd the seed come from? And they're like a Columbo. They're going to track this thing. If I say I brought an Asia, they're going to say, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to quarantine your nursery. We're going to test this stuff. We don't know how long it's going to take. 
be careful where you're getting the bamboo from. You know, make sure it's a good, reliable source. You know, the tissue culture, it's, it's very vigorous. This is a flatwoods grove. This is probably one of the best bamboo blocks in the state. You can see the water furrow. It's still already getting crowded. I think there's 12 foot middles, but uh, you got to have a combination of a shoot and, uh, and a cone market to, to make this thing work, I believe. That's just, that's the most important thing. One of the most important things I'm gonna advocate is, is, is spacing. More's not better in this case. More gets big, they crowd each other out, they start competing against each other for nutrients and water. And then the worst thing in the world is it's not accessible to go down and do anything. I mean, we're not in China. We don't have a billion people to run through the bamboo with machetes. It's not going to work that way here. In a drill, it's 15 feet. So we're looking at a couple, we're doing a, uh, an evaluation block at, where our nursery is at, in Frostproof. We're putting out different settings. Uh, the ridge is going to be probably uh, the most challenging uh, growing area. And this is a ridge picture here. These things grow fast even in the sand. So you've got to be on top of mo moving that little micro sprinkler back like Roger's asking about because what happens they crowd and you got you got to keep moving that jet back about every three or four months or before you know it that micro sprinkler is going to be right in the middle of the clump then that spray is going to get dis distorted the pattern will and it won't have very good coverage doesn't have good co coverage you start having root die back you start having shoot die back less shoots less shoots less money so it's important to have that sprinkler positioned correctly and to be on top of moving it as that plant grows like I said, it's a ridge site, it's planted flat. Uh, they're in there pretty pretty tight. So it could be problems down the road here as well. Any ridge is critical. Do not let these things dry out. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I see microjet systems are great systems. And we, have, we still have that citrus mentality. Well, we'll run it for a six hour run and we'll be okay for four or five days. These things need it when they get established every day for at least 30 minutes per application, two to three times a day. And you're going to think, man, that's a lot of work. Well, you can put a timer on there, but I mean, it's critical. I've seen a lot of setbacks from the plants just not getting enough. And that's what they've got to have on the sandy ridge. The flatwoods is a little bit more forgiving. You know, it's got, got a, it's a tighter soil profile, so it has better hold capacity for moisture and, and nutrients. But the sand, the sand's forgiving is good. You make a mistake, you can cover it up quick, but it needs to have that water because sand is granulated larger granulated sand but the flatwoods so it has hardly no holding capacity in the summer heat that's a double bad i'm kind of alluding to the and the sand content a 10 to 50 percent is a, a ratio that's that you have generally in flatwoods ph it's five and a half to seven and a half seems to be adequate and these are early like this is only like a one to two year observations so this could change. Uh, soils containing calcium and phosphorus. Uh, Ormerson's already said the, how important phosphorus is and calcium. And of course, nitrogen's like an accelerator. That's what makes the car go fast or slow. But uh, to have power and, and make it grow, that calcium is very important in developing tissue. The cal that's what develops tissue in uh, plants, any type of plant. You know, if you're a bodybuilder or you're wanting to be a big person and lift weights and grow muscle, you, eat, you got, got, have protein, high protein content, builds muscle. A high tissue fiber growth is calcium. Calcium is what drives it. That's real important. Phosphorus for the roots, obviously. Biochar pro, uh, product uh, we've put out has done a very good job of retaining moisture and nutrients in these sandy soils we have on a ridge. And all, all bamboo can be made into biochars. So there's, there's opportunities. It'll cut your fertilizer by 30% and your, and your water use that we know of. So I, I'm endorsing it because we've tried it in the sands and on the ridge. And we have got to have something like that. It, it retains that fertilizer and that water there for longer periods of time. We're working on a production guide. I've got a couple people in this room helping me that are experts in that area as well to where there's going to be a, a playbook on how to properly take care of these bamboo from start to finish. That's very important because uh, some people have gotten into it and you know we use what knowledge we had from growing citrus or other crops, but bamboo's a little different. It's got some different needs from the N, P, and K in certain times of the year. Uh, certain levels are, are, are like Ormelson said, when a plant gets to a certain age, it needs more inputs from calcium. 
uh, or other elements it needs. So it, it changes as it gets older. Some recommendations on some observations we've made. You know, a lot of us have this uh, generic young tree fertilizer. It's got the miners. It's a little or lower analysis, so it eliminates uh, burn if you put too much in. We're advocating putting a quarter pound to a plant with something like an 848, uh, the young citrus tree blend. Now, I've talked about the calcium, but that's a little later as they develop. A liquid feed program is good to supplement during the dry part of the year, just like we do in citrus. Uh, when it starts raining a lot, you don't want to put liquid out. It won't stay in the sandy soil very long. It just goes right through, right down past the root zone. So that's when we do the dry application. Manure and compost, uh, that's an important soil conditioner. Use an option, uh, either that or the biochar or both. I uh, think they complement each other, so that's something important to consider uh, on this real, real sandy soil we have. All right, I put this in red, I'm, I'm going to keep saying this, about this soil moisture. Because that's a big problem I've seen everywhere, is it's just not, we don't compensate enough water to get these things kick-started and going. Uh, when you get them planted, you know, that plant's in a hostile environment. It came from the nursery where it had it made, now it's out on the, on the battlefield where it's got to survive. We've got to make it battle ready. You make it battle ready by conditioning it and, and uh, the water is very important because like I said it'll it if, if, if it doesn't I've seen in cases where they defoliated uh, and, and the roots the shoots just started dying back and also if they're in that weak condition if you get a cold spell if you get something down where it's uh, in the zone of maybe the upper 20s low 30s it'll damage them even worse because the plants are not conditioned and it's all about water and nutrients but, but water is an important key for these. I put in here that Asper we know has uh, some chloride issues to, to a high level. Uh, like if you use muriate of potash as a source of your fertilizer, that's high chlorides. Yeah, it's great, great for potassium, and it's not so much the sodium is what kills it, it's the chlorides is what kills it. So try to use low chlorine. It needs a certain amount of sodium uh, as it gets older. It needs it to help in cone production as well. I don't have those rates. That's something we'll get from Ormiston on the sodium. That's a real sensitive area. Herbicide. Uh, we talked about the ground cover. Uh, this is another alternative, but you got to be very careful because this is a uh, uh, glyphosate. Uh, you can use glyphosinate, which uh, it is detrimental if it hits the leaves or the, or the, or the, or the root system. Glyphosate sometimes gets in the root system if they're really shallow and it can cause more damage than a glyphosinate. So there's a couple of different forms of the glyphos. Uh, this is, uh, these are some wick applicators and you can buy a couple of, buy these. Uh, these you can buy, I think from like Rule King or Tractor Supply. This is a homemade job. Uh, that's called the Elite Wiper. It takes a lot to handle that one. This is the mop method. Got a good friend of mine who uses the mop method. And actually it has done the best because you put about a 2% solution of glyphos in the bucket of water and you just drag this thing across the, all these weeds. So the mop method, it's, it's kind of slow and stupid, but it works. I think he had three laborers that did uh, 16 acres in a day and a half. It's in three times a year, that's not bad. Weed control, this has been, besides water, this is like maybe the number two killer. This is, there's your bamboo there. This is guinea grass here. So you need, the relationship is a guinea grass needs to be here or be brown. This plant doesn't hardly have a chance in hell. This is a few months later where the, uh, he decided to go into herbicide. They've just, they've lost like 30%. So weed control is critical, uh, just as important as water. And this guinea grass, it's big clumps. It likes to hug against the bamboo and guess who's gonna win the battle? The guinea grass is, cause it's the most more prolific grower. Last message I got, we need a lot of acres of bamboo. Hal said 10,000 acres for this plant, but he's got plans to have about five or six other plants. Hopefully we'll have, he'll have some down closer to you guys in South Florida. Uh, you got to start somewhere. This is a starting point. It's going to, uh, when I first talked to Hal, he started out telling me he needed about 50,000 acres. And then before he left, he was talking about 100,000 acres. Of course, this is over several years time, but uh, there's a, a lot of opportunities in this, in this area. So um, we got a lot of plants to grow and a lot of ground to plant. Any questions?